Hi everyone, welcome to Lecture 7P of Useful Genetics, where we're going to talk about relatedness. We'll talk about paternity testing first. This is a topic that really would have fit in our discussion of DNA fingerprinting, except that we hadn't really talked about inheritance yet, and it's hard to talk about paternity when you haven't re yet really thought about inheritance. We'll then think about lots of levels of relatedness, not just parent and child, but siblings and aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins and second cousins and third cousins, um, looking in each case at how much genetic sharing, how many share, what proportion of shared alleles is expected for each level of relationship. And then we're going to look at some real genome comparisons based on SNP typing analysis of family members that will let us see how real genomes compare to the ideal predictions of the theory. So here's um, a diagram from our discussion of DNA fingerprinting. And you'll remember that these colored blocks represent different alleles of 13 different VNTR loci, loci, where VNTR stands for variable number tandem repeat. So we have two alleles of this locus in the father, two other alleles in the mother, two alleles of the second locus in the father, two alleles of the second locus in the mother. And from these, meiosis selects a random combination of the alleles in the two sets in the parents to pass to each child. And the consequence is every child has different combinations, but every child has one allele that's identical to an allele in the father and one allele that's identical to an allele in the mother. Now, when this is applied in a paternity testing situation, here's how it works out. So the father's DNA is scored for which allele he has at each of the 13 VNTR loci. I've only shown six here. And the child is also scored. If the father is truly the father of the child, then at every locus, one of the child's alleles must match the father's one of the father's alleles. So here, okay, the child's got seven and four, the father's got seven and five, so that allele matches. The child's got six and four, oh, the father's got two allele fours, etc. And for true paternity, every allele must have a match. Five and five, and eleven and eleven. So provided this carried through for, for all 13 alleles, we would say, yes, this person, this man, is the father of this child. Now, here's another child. We can do the same analysis. Um, a seven, I'll do it in a different color. Seven, yes. A four, yes. A six, yes. A three, yes. A six and a seven, uh oh, no match. A Thirteen and a seven, uh oh, no match. Now, a certain number of matches are expected just by chance because these alleles are quite common in the population, and it's not unexpected for even unrelated individuals to have alleles in common. The test really works the other way. Having alleles in common doesn't prove that the man is the father. Failing to have alleles in common is very strong evidence that the man is not the father. Now, because VNTR loci mutate at a high rate relative to normal chromosomal genes, it's usually not considered sufficient that one of the 13 alleles doesn't match. Does, one of the 13 loci doesn't have a match. It's usually required that at least two of the loci don't have a match in order to say definitively that the man is not the father of the child. So paternity testing won't prove absolutely that a man is the father of a child, but it can prove very, very, to very, very high confidence that he is not the father 
grandparents. Well, I'm showing this diagram, which I've showed before, because I want to introduce one new term. I think it was obvious that I was using colors in this diagram to indicate relationships of sequences. So, for instance, this blue sequence would be a version, a copy of that blue sequence, which is a copy of that blue sequence. And we would describe these sequences as being um, identical, and we would describe sequences in related individuals as being identical by descent. So this segment of this sequence is identical by descent to this blue segment in this other child. They both inherited it from a common ancestor, their father. So it's identical by descent. And we could trace it farther back. If we looked at cousins, we would find that cousins have some um, segments of their genomes in common that they inherited identical by descent from a grandparent. Now, on this slide, I've created a diagram showing the predicted levels of relatedness, the um, percent of alleles in the genome where two individuals are expected to be identical by descent. And these alleles will occur in segments of identical or very closely related sequence, um, as showed in the previous diagram. So the first value is for identical twins. I haven't shown them on the graph. Identical twins have identical alleles at all loci, so we would say they are 100% related. That's their level of genetic relatedness is 100%. Parent and child are 50% identical. That's because one of the child's two alleles is at every locus identical to one of the parent's alleles. And that's true for this parent. It's also true for this parent. The same level of relationship is seen for full siblings, but for different reasons, as you'll see in a few minutes. Um, if we compare grandparent to grandchild here, or aunt or uncle to niece or nephew, we expect to see 25% identity and if we compare cousins, we expect to see about 12.5% identity. Now you'll notice that each time we go down one generation on one side or the other of the tree, the relatedness drops by a factor of two. So when we go from siblings to cousins, it drops by a factor of four, a factor of two here and a factor of two here. When we go down to second cousins, it'll drop by a further factor of four. So second cousins only have about 3% of their alleles in common. Third cousins only have less than 1%. And fourth cousins only about 0.2%. Now, it's these third, fourth, and further cousins that are the relationships that 23andMe most commonly find because we all have many more third and fourth and fifth cousins, then we have first or second cousins. Now let's look at some real genomes and see what real relatedness looks like. And I'll start by showing, what I'm going to show you are diagrams generated by 23andMe when members of different generations of the same family have had their DNA tested. 23andMe will compare any two individuals. Um, but in this case, what they've compared is a parent and their child. And the color code is explained here. Um, the gray segments are places where there's not enough information to type. Typically, this is places on the chromosome where there's a lot of repetitive DNA. And the blue bars are places where the two individuals are half identical, where they have one allele in common. And we see that between parent and child, they're half identical everywhere. And that's exactly what we expect because the child's genome, one of its two copies of every gene, came from that parent. The other copy came from the other parent. So this is exactly what we would expect. Now let's look at a comparison between a grandfather and a grandchild. 
This is two generations. Now our clean blue lines are broken up into segments. So there are segments of the child's chromosome that are identical to segments of the grandfather's cr chromosome. And then there are other segments that are not identical. And these will be segments that are derived from the other grandparent. Rather than from the grandfather, they're derived from the grandmother. Again, the cross-hatched and gray segments are places where the DNA was not analyzed. Now, this pedigree, this diagram, um, we can interpret the boundaries between the blue and white segments as places where crossovers occurred in a meiosis, um, generating new connections between the grandmother and the grandfather's chromos homologs. This question asks you, where did that meiosis happen? In which person was that meiosis? And the answer is that that meiosis occurred in the child's mother. That's the one place where a chromosome from the grandmother and a chromosome from the grandmother were both present, as shown here. So it's in the mother that there was the meiosis that produced the mother's egg had a crossover at this position, and that crossover generated this recombinant chromosome that was put into the egg and then gave rise to the child. Now, here's a more complicated diagram. It goes back another generation. So we've now got four generations that have been typed by 23andMe. Again, the light blue line is continuous for the length of the chromosome, and that shows identity by descent between the mother and the child, exactly what we would expect. The green segments show identity between the child and their grandparent. So these are segments of the grandparent DNA. Here I've shown it as if it was the grandmother that were passed by the mother onto the child. And again, the breakpoints between the green segments and the not green adjacent segments represent crossovers that happened in the mother between the green chromosome and the white chromosome, the grandparental chromosomes. Finally, the dark blue lines represent segments that the child inherited intact from the great-grandfather. And you can see that overall there is only about half as many segments from that are dark blue as there are segments that are green. Now, in this diagram, you should be able to identify segments that have the properties that indicate the events that gave rise to them. So there may be segments, here's an example of one, where the great grandparental segment was inherited intact in the child. Um, nothing changed in the grandparent. So that's a place where crossovers happened outside of this segment. No crossovers happened in this segment. You can also find segments where the great-grandparental segment is shorter at one end than the grandparent, so there would have been a crossover there, and segments where the great-grandparental segment is shorter at both ends here. And we can say, well, there would have been a crossover there and a crossover there. Finally, we can find segments that did not come from the great-grandparent at all, such as this one. There's no dark blue DNA in this region at all. This would be a segment that came from the other great-grandparent. And we can find segments where there's no segment even from the grandparent. For instance, this whole chromosome, the child inherited the grandmother's chromosome and nothing from the grandfather. Now, I'm going to show you one more comparison, and that's between two siblings. And even though two siblings share the same 
have the same 50% identity predicted as a parent and a child, the pattern of sequence identity is very different. Between parent and child, it's one allele is identical throughout the whole length of all the chromosomes. But for siblings, there are segments indicated by dark blue where the two siblings have identical alleles at both alleles. So they both got the same allele from their mom and they both got the same allele from their dad. There are lots of segments indicated in light blue where they're half identical. That means they either both got the same allele from their mom or they both got the same allele from their dad but not both. And then there are long white segments where they got different alleles from their mom and different alleles from their dad. So there could be parts of your genome where you're identical to your sister and other parts where your genomes are completely different. So what we've done, we talked about paternity testing, how to think about DNA for fingerprinting in the context of parent-child relationships. You can also extend this, of course, to thinking about more distant relationships. For instance, for um, immigration hearings, it's often desirable to have evidence of a family relationship. For instance, if you wanted to be able to bring your nephew into the country, you might be asked to provide DNA fingerprinting type evidence to show that this person actually is your nephew. We considered the average predicted levels of relatedness for different kinds of family relationships. And then we looked at what real examples of relatedness are like from real SNP typing data. Coming up next, we're going to continue thinking about relatedness, but we're going to move farther back in time and think about what happens to ancestral haplotypes, segments of DNA that we inherit from more distant ancestors. I hope to see you there.